Okay, so the hallway looks... Maybe like this, okay? So we'll call this A and this B. So I'm just going to assume that you got the picture, the, the picture right. But there's actually more to this than just this picture. Well, poles are usually straight, but wow. One more try. Wow, okay, that's the best I'm gonna do. All right, very tough to keep stirring this. It needs to have like kind of a, more of a felty thing to, more friction. All right, so hopefully you got this much, but this isn't the whole story, why not? Yeah, Will. Yeah, so we need another, so it's kind of like we need to also see what's going on with the ceiling. So it's like if we we're looking in from this direction here, we can draw another picture of this. Okay, and so what is this right here? Like how much you're uh, pointing the hole or whatever up so you can get around the corner. Right, but exactly, so but what is that representing? More simply than that. Pole. That's the pole, right? So we can call it capital L. What's this right here? That's the ceiling height, which is fixed at 8. Okay, what's this right here? How does this relate to the situation, this down here? Ben? Yeah, so it's like, this is like, if just the ground view, like the top view of the ground, so this is actually like the projection of the pole. So it's exactly the, this, exactly the same dimension as this. Do you see that? So if you break this up into L1 and L2, then the projection onto the ground is L1 plus L2, like this. And then I think I, yeah. It could be the shadow, yeah, the shadow or the projection of the pole onto the ground, right. So it's like if you were looking down on, on the pole, it, would, it wouldn't look its full length. It would look shorter. It would look the horizontal dimension, right, if you look down on it. Okay. So and I think, maybe not Monday, but last week, I, I think I suggested that this angle would be a good way to kind of define this problem. You've got lots of quantities here, so this is a real good practice at juggling quantities, organizing how these quantities are related together, and what's going to be our centerpiece of the problem in solving this? What do we want to find in the end? What's that? Yeah, so we're going to find some, this quantity L, so therefore the centerpiece of our solution will be what? If you learn one thing about optimization problems, this is it. If we want to know something about L, then what? We want to know the maximum, okay? What? Yeah, so we want an L function, right? So the whole the whole thing is going to center around the L function. So we can start with this. The this is called the elevation view, right? So it's like what you see up and down elevation. So how can we get the the general L function from the elevation view? L equals what? Yeah, so no matter how we change this angle theta, we'll always get a right triangle there, right? So it'll be the square root of 64 squared plus. Eight, yeah, thank you. Okay, do we got it? 
so now what we need to do is we need to, uh, what, how can we get this function now in the form that we want? We want L as a function of? Theta. So what do we have to do in order to achieve that, L as a function of theta? Yeah, Will. What's that? Yeah, we've, t we've seen this lots, where we initially get the function and we've got more than one quantity in there. And so we have to reduce it down to one quantity by finding the relationships with these quantities, right? So we want to get L1 in terms of theta and L2 in terms of theta. So how are we going to get L1 in terms of theta? Well, we can make these triangles here. So is there an angle in this triangle that's also theta? This one? No, because this is a right angle here, right? These aren't vertical angles. This is a right angle. So this one is theta. So now, what's L1 in terms of theta? How, do we, how can we bring together L1? So this is A here. So sine theta equals... Opposite over hypotenuse. We kind of did that quickly last time. That should have been review. And then um, cosine of theta in the second triangle is B over L2. Okay, so it's much more important to understand what's going on rather than get all this down in the, in the homework. Okay? So do you, do you follow? Any questions so far? Is everything making sense? So then what is L1? What is it, Calvin? A over sine theta. Or that's also A cosecant theta. And then um, L2 is B secant, because cosine is 1 over Secant is 1 over cosine. So there we got it, where we got our L as a function of theta. Okay, how are we going to find critical points for L? I know that Will knows. Sam, how do we find critical points? Huh? Take the derivative. Okay, so when we take the derivative, we're going to get... First, we're going to get... 1 over 2 times the square root of this thing, right? And then in the numerator, we're going to get... Or so times the derivative of the inside. So the derivative of the inside will be 0 plus... What's the derivative of this? 2 a cosecant theta plus b secant theta to the 1 times, by the chain rule, the derivative of the inside, which is negative a cosecant theta cotangent theta plus b uh, secant tangent. Okay, I'll stop there. So questions on the relationships of the, all the lengths and distances and the angle? Getting the function and getting the first derivative. Anybody have a question? So don't just copy for your homework. Think. I mean, I, I'm tempted just to have you turn in the homework. I want you to think. I want you to think about it. Rather than just writing the symbols down. Okay, and so then I sent an email out yesterday saying that we can um, 
from here on out, we can just graph the derivative and use the graph of the derivative to answer the question that we need to answer. Okay? Now, in this particular case, uh, that won't work exactly because we've got these, the a and b. So the only way we can truly get the angle theta that we want in terms of a and b is, is really we have to do the algebra. Okay? But we can just set, say, b equals to 1 and a equals to 2 and get the specific answer for this case using um, the graph of the derivative. Okay, but if, if, this, if we want the solution in terms of these constants, then really algebra is the only way it's going to work. But we'll go ahead and let's do a, a graphic solution using a equals 2 and b equals 1. So I'm going to put this function in, okay? So a is 2, so 2 cosecant x plus secant x. plus b is 1, and that's all over, 2 square root, make sure I'm typing everything right. Does it look like I have it the way we said? Okay, so before we graph it, let's just talk quickly about how would you find the zeros of this function. So that's, that's the thing, right? We know that our critical points are where the derivative is zero. You should have a really good understanding of why that's true. But how would you find where this thing is zero? We've got this giant fraction here. So what will that look like determining values of theta that make it equal to zero? Just a quick algebra review here. So I really have, so the, the twos can go away, but I really have this thing times this thing over this thing. How does it all play into values of theta that will make the whole fraction zero? Joe? Okay, so set it equal to zero. Now, so how how will this how will we solve it? Okay, Joe, next step. Yeah, really, so how do we get a fraction to be zero? Ben. Yeah, so the denominator, first of all, it can't be zero, but there's nothing we can do to the denominator to make a fraction zero. So this really doesn't play into it down here. So we need the numerator to be zero, and so, Ben, what did you say? Yeah, so, so if that were zero, this whole thing would be zero, or if that were zero, this whole thing would be zero. So you, you're going to solve for a theta that makes that zero and makes that zero, and you have to check to make sure your answers make sense. What happens is this theta ends up being a negative angle, which doesn't make sense. So this isn't what's going to give us our solution. So it turns out that this right here is what gives us the angle theta that will make this whole thing zero. So that's just a kind of an overview of the algebra. Can I erase what's on the screen? Okay, so now I'm going to, I can leave it up for a little bit, but, so now we're going to graph this. When we graph this, we really have to understand what we're looking at, what the quantities mean, and how the graph is representing it. Okay, I'm going to erase. Okay, so we get this.
So what are we looking at? So you really have to be confident. And the, the way, the thing you got to start to think about is what do the coordinates mean? What does the x coordinate mean and what does the y coordinate mean? Savannah. She wants the x coordinate to be theta. Okay, yeah, so yeah, first thing to do is identify what values are on your x axis. That's your theta, that's your input. Okay? Okay, so the y coordinate is the length. Roman, agree with that? Why not? What do we graph? What 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 equation did we graph? The length of the pole with respect to theta. The length of this pole with respect to theta. Connor, agree with that? <coughs> yeah, we graph we graph the rate of change, right? This function is the output is rate of change. So these values up here on the y axis mean? Yeah, L prime theta. Okay, so now we're going to ask what values make sense in our situation. So, so here's the hallway. Oh, first try. There we go. So what? Let's start with theta. What values make sense? What's a kind of a smallest value and a greatest value that makes sense? And we want to limit our graph just to those x quantities. What's that? Yeah. So neg what would a negative angle look like? It would be like this, right? It's impossible. So the smallest angle we could have would be zero, like this This whole thing was tilted all the way down here. Okay, so we can make zero be the lowest. What about the, what's the greatest value of theta that makes sense? Yeah, so how far this way can we turn it? And what would theta be at the maximum turning point? So what's, yeah, so the max, the farthest we could go is kind of with the pole was like this, right? And then what would that angle be? Pi halves. So let's just limit our graph to that. And then we're looking at what makes sense. Pi halves is about 1.6. Okay, so what's going on here? What are we looking at? Length of the pole? Jenica, what, is, what are we looking at? Rate of change. And our solution for a critical point is going to be when the rate of change is? Zero. Okay, so that's right here. And... Graphing calculator will lock on to that point. If you just drag, it'll lock on. So I got this value of theta equals 0.9. Now this is only for a equals 2, b equals 1. So this is the limitation to doing it graphically like this. We're not getting a value in terms of the dimensions of the hallways. It's specifically for this case. Okay, but it's still, we got lots we can talk about. So what does it tell us down here? So when we're, when theta is less than 0.9, what's going on here? So this is our coordinating first, second derivatives. All right, the rate of change is negative. So what is it, what, it, what can we conclude? So over here for values less than 0.9, you said rate of change is less than zero. What does it mean? Connor? Does that mean you get a shorter pull around the corner? Um, you know, but if the rate of change is negative, then what, what's a con just a general conclusion about the original L function? Accumulation is negative. Patrick, agree with that? So if the rate of change is negative, then that means that the accumulation is negative. Jimin? Accumulation is decreasing. 
Okay, and then over here, rate of change is. Positive, right? So L is. So the length of the pole is decreasing, then the rate of change is zero, then the length of the pole is increasing. Jeff, what does that whole situation tell us? So d just in terms of just the quantities L and theta. So at theta equals 0.9, what is this whole thing telling us? What's happening at theta equals 0.9? Nathan? Uh -huh. We have a maximum value of L. Agree with that? What's that? Yutong says minimum. Charles, which is it, max or min? Will? I don't think it's either of them because we, we don't have the sort of like, we don't have something that's uh, as a rate of change that's, uh, oh wait, the accumulation function would be a minimum. Minimum. Jerry? Minimum. L is decreasing. And then, and then the derivative is zero, and then L is increasing. Right there, minimum. So what happened? Is it right? What is this telling us? What length of pole can we get, do we have when theta is zero? So when theta is zero, what length of pole do we have? How long of a pole can we fit? Ben? No, when theta is zero, so here's the pole, right? So how long of a pole can we fit? This is A here, right? And this is B. Yeah, Kelvin. Okay, but so when we set everything up, though, we didn't take that into account. We didn't we didn't set that that limit on B. So really, we were the way that we set this up. We were just measuring the space that's the space that's available. So now when theta is zero, we're really asking, what's the space available for a pole? How long? No limit, right? So this could just go on and on. And what about when theta is 90? Same thing, right? No limit to how long that pole could be. So what's going on here? What's the deal? We wanted a maximum length of the pole. Any ideas? Yeah. So, okay, so you want to go back and kind of change what we set up? Yeah, yeah no, let's not do that. That's, that's like starting over. We've got, we, we just have to think about this the right way. We have the solution. We just want to think about it the right way. So really, instead of, instead of, modeling the length of the pole, we really, we're modeling the space that we have for different angles. We're modeling how much space we have at different angles. Yeah, Jimin. So, um, that's the minimum space that you can have between the, the pole and the pole. Right. So, the minimum space... Right, do you see? So it's, you're really not max, so the way we set up the problem, we're really finding 
the minimum space that you have as you go around because that's the longest pole that you could fit around. So you really had to you had to kind of think about the wrap your mind around that. It's it's kind of you, you know it says the longest pole right, but you really unless the way we set it up, you're really saying what's the minimum space? What's the as you go around because you have you have all the space that you want before you start to turn. And then as you turn, the space that you have keeps going down and down and down, but then it goes up and up and up again. So the longest pull you could have is where the space is the least. And so, the, so really, it is, we are finding a minimum. Okay, so what is the longest, how do we get the largest pull? Will? Well, since we have our, we essentially have two minimums then, then that is the minimum space for 90 degrees and then for essentially zero. Um, so what we want is somewhere between that. We know that our maximum is there. Okay, I wasn't following that. The, we have all this, we have an unlimited amount of space at zero. That's what I was saying. We don't have a minimum space. We have unlimited space at zero and 90. And as we start to turn the corner, the space we have available begins to decrease. And then as we keep turning, it'll start increasing again until we, when we make it all the way around, we have an unlimited amount of space. So what we, what we really did here, are the value L is, is not the length of the pole, but it's a, it's a measure of how much space we have as theta turns. So we're looking for the minimum amount of space that we have as we go around. And that's going to be the longest pole that we can get around the corner. Does that make sense? So we found the minimum. We found it right here. So now how are we going to get the length of the longest pole with that minimum, this, with this angle, 0 0.9? What's that? Yeah, so we, that was the whole, remember the centerpiece of the, the problem was the length function. It tells us the length of pole for any angle theta. So when we put that in, that's going to give us this minimum value, which is the longest possible pull we could get around the corner. Okay, any other questions? Again, in this, in this particular problem, we'd have to use algebra. If we wanted theta as a function of a and b, we'd have to go through that, that algebra. And for any who did, I think it was the cube root, tangent of the cube root, or the cube root of the tangent? Tangent of the cube root of b over a? Something like that, if you work it out. I'm, I'd sit with you and work as long as you want outside of class, work out that algebra. I'm happy to do that if you want to do it. Is that what it was? Saskia, is that what it was? I said, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Okay. So you've got some more, again, for uh, Friday. You're welcome to, so it's kind of your option. If you want to do the algebra, finding where the derivative is zero, or graph the derivative and use reasoning like we did. So either way. But always keeping track of what the numbers mean, what the quantities mean, or else you can't interpret what's going on at the end. That's really important. You're able to interpret what's going on at the end. Okay. So let's do some more big picture stuff today. Remember this first half of the course? So go ahead, hand up your homework. As you're doing that, see if you, without flipping back in your notes, without flipping back in your notes, see if you remember what this is. If we have a rate of change function, what's the accumulation defined by R beginning accumulating at A? Without looking at your notes, does anybody in your number? How many people think they know? Raise your hand if you think you could write out the accumulation function starting at A. No one. We spent a month building it. Anyone?
one think they could be close? Roman. So what will this, what is the function, that's the accumulation, starting at A? Okay, what do you think? Will? Since we have it um, from A to X already, mm -hmm. we can't have X in the um, actual equation for itself, so we have to go into something like T. Um, and it's uh, R of T minus A. Mm -hmm. R of T minus A? Okay, we never did that. But you think these. Yeah, Jack? Yeah, so that, that's, that's what you were saying. Yeah, exactly. That's it. Okay, so we won't go over it, but you should remember and recall all the parts of that. They all have meaning, and we, we fleshed out all the meaning of that. Okay, so hopefully that reminds you. So, um, so let's see be any number greater than A. So let's so suppose we start accumulating at at C here, and we're accumulating along, and this says oh sorry at A at A we start accumulating at A, and we're going to accumulate up to X, and X is variable right? Now let's C be any value greater than A say there. So here's a statement. What is this state statement in general? What is it saying? Somebody here. How about Isabel? And what is the accumulation from A to C plus C to X? Yeah, does it make sense? Yeah, if you're accumulating all the way from A to X, and we just we kind of chopped it here at a point, then we it would be the same as accumulating from A to C, and then accumulating from C to X, and then adding up all that accumulation, right? Okay, so here's the so that's accumulation from A to X. We've broken it up into two parts: accumulation from A to C plus accumulation from C to X. So here, all I'm doing here is just solving for solving for this. So to solve for that term right there, I would just I'm just going to subtract that. So that equals this one minus this one. Okay, but what is that right there? What is that? What's that? What do we call that? <coughs> What is the accumulation from A to X defined earlier? Do we have a shorter way of writing that? Yeah, just F of X, right? It's just this thing right here. Just F of X. Okay, so that's the function accumulating from A to X, and now minus the accumulation from A to C. So how can we express that using that function f of x? So this is the function accumulating up to x, f of x. Now, how can we use that function and express the accumulation up to c? What's that? No, not quite. Mm -mm. Just f of c, right? So, so it's just f of c. Okay. So what? So this actually has. Um, significant uh, results. 
and let's find out why. Okay, so here's that result. So what does that do for us? So here's an accumulation function, x squared. What is its rate of change function? Ashlyn? 2x, agree? That's it, it's rate of change. So now suppose I have this accumulation function. I want to start accumulating from 3 of that rate. So I want to accumulate this rate function. Uh, starting at 3. So now, how can we write this? This result that we just found on the last page, how can we write this in a different form? What is it? Nick? What does this thing equal according to what we found on the previous page? Two x minus six. So, is it r of x minus r of three? That's what he's doing. Is it Dalton? Is it r of x minus r of three? Not sure. You tell. Yeah. So the so the result we just found on the previous page says that accumulation function can be written as f of x minus f of c. And what is Saskia, what are those? How could we, what's f of x and what's f of 3? So what's f of x, Mary? f of x minus f of 3. Will. x squared minus, yeah, x squared minus 3 squared. All right, so f of x is x squared minus 3 squared. Okay, so let's um, do another one. e to the x squared, rate of change function. Jennifer. Two e to the x, two e to the x. What do we think? It's Adra. Rate of change function. Two e to the x. Jerry. Okay, and what rule are you using there? Yeah, it's a chain rule, right? So e to the x squared, e to the something. The derivative is that same, e to the something, and then by the chain rule, we got also 2x. So don't, the mastery stuff was, the point of it, the importance of it, the reason we did it was hopefully those, the, the rules will stick so we can just get the rate of change functions fast. Okay, so now I want to have the accumulation function starting at negative 2 of this rate function. So we have another way to write it now. Charles, how can we rewrite this? accumulation function for that rate function. f of x minus f of negative 2. Which is what, John? e to the x squared. So e to the x squared minus 2x e to the x squared? Saskia, what is it? Um, it's e to the x squared minus e to the negative 2 squared. That's right. e to the x squared minus e to the negative 2 squared. So let's check this. We can, so what can we do? On graphing calculator, we can graph. So really what we're talking about here is this is an open or closed form of accumulation function. Remember open and closed forms? It's open or closed, remember? Open, right? This is, it's equal to this. Is this open or closed form? 
closed. So what we're talking about now is getting a closed form accumulation function. We've never had that before. Okay? We've never had that before. So that's what we're so on graphing calculator we can compare. We can graph it, have graphing calculator do the open form for us and do the closed form. And if they're the same, then what should happen? What's that? Yeah, the graph should match up. Okay, so what was our original function? E to the x squared. What was our rate? 2x e to the x squared. And we wanted to accumulate starting at negative 2. And we found, so let's turn that off. So let's graph that first. Okay. So that's our open form or closed form. Okay, but we have a way now of getting that in closed form. What is it? Patrick? Uh, e to the x squared. Okay, e to the x squared minus e to the negative. Okay, so there's the open form. Now I'm going to graph the closed form, and what should happen? Land right on top of it, which it does. So if I turn off the open form, there's the closed. Both of them. Just start it on the next slide, sorry. All right, so let's kind of summarize this. This is big picture stuff here, big picture. We're coming full circle here. With, what, with everything we've learned, it's tying it all together. It's tying it all together. So in the first half of the course, we had an exact rate of change function in closed form. And we, we slowly built up an exact accumulation function in open form. And in general, what kind of, how did we represent that in general? What was it? What kind of thing represents an exact accumulation function in open form? Nicole, you know? Kirsten? Okay. Crystal? Not sure. It's the same question I asked earlier in class. Savannah? Yeah, you did. Yeah. That thing, right. Integral, right? Integral. That's our integral, right? That was the whole first half of course. And then in the last month, we started with an exact accumulation function in closed form, and we developed all these rules, right? The mastery for getting an exact rate of change in closed form. So first half of the course, second half of the course. But now on the left, those two things are really just the same thing. The exact rate of change function, okay? They're, they're the exact rate of change function. So now what we're talking about is the last kind of piece of the puzzle that we didn't have. Given an exact rate of change in closed form, can we get an exact accumulation in closed form rather than just the open form? Okay? And we can do that... When can we do that? When can we get an exact accumulation in closed form? If the rate that we started with, if we had the accumulation function that got us that rate in the first place. So if we have an accumulation function, we find its rate of change function that tells us two things. So we have an accumulation function, and from it we get the rate of change function. We found out two things, not just one thing. What's one of the things we found out? 
Okay. One of the things we found out was what is the rate of change function for that accumulation function? But now we also know what the accumulation function is for that rate of change function, right? So it's like we've just come in a big circle. Okay, anybody have a question? So I know this is, this is what we're going to be talking more about this. So if it's not 100% crystal clear right now, that's fine. But I just wanted to kind of introduction to what we're going to do in the, the next week, which is basically this is the fundamental theorem of calculus. It's the it kind of brings together all the ideas that we've been working on all semester. Okay, see you Friday.